everyone, Andrew Praper here with Great Expectations Realty and it is Monday, October 31st, so that means it's time for What's Up Ocala. Thank you so much for joining me and first off, I got a phone call the other day and it was from a um, friend Levy and he was like, congratulations, and I'm like, great, for what? <laughs> He's like, you finally passed 3,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel, congratulations. So I actually was the second person to know. Uh, so I just want to say a huge, huge shout out, a huge thank you to everyone that has been watching, everyone that has been um, subscribing and has been helping us and motivating us. Um, it really does help us and encourage us to keep going uh, since you guys are obviously still watching. So thank you so much for that. I really feel incredibly blessed and just um, just really inspired. So thank you. If you have been one of those that have been supporting us and uh, talking and, and commenting and all sorts of stuff, thank you. It, I read every single comment. It comes up on my, on my uh, computer and I absolutely love hearing from you guys. So thank you. Um, it, it's just been, it's been a wild ride the last few years, but, um, we're really enjoying connecting with all of you from all parts of the world, not just in the United States, but just all over the place. Um, who would have thought that anybody had so much interest in our little small town of Ocala? That's really cool. <laughs> so, um, over the years we've gotten to meet so many of you and, um, I, even next week as somebody is meeting with us, they said they saw us on YouTube and wanted to come in and have a cup of coffee. It's so it, it's just awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, 3,000 thank yous. <laughs> that is just so cool. Um, okay, so there was a few different things I was looking at talking about today. Um, I was looking at like the stats and the statistics and the generations and how that is impacting real estate and um, kind of stuff over the years. Like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you guys are sick to death about hearing about the interest rate. I don't know about you guys. I'm definitely sick to death of hearing about it. Um, looking at it over the time that it has been out there though, um, over the last 50 years, looking at the historical statistics, which I love statistics. I try not to irritate you guys to death and bore you to death with all the statistics, but I can go down a rabbit hole. I will go down and look at charts, graphs, and statistics all day long if I could. Um, but looking at the mortgage rates over the last 50 years, we're still not quite at the average for the last 50 years. We're actually a little bit below, which is kind of crazy, right? Uh, but no, it's the actual average interest rate for the last 50 years, so 1972 to, or to 2022, um, is 7.77%. 7 we are at 7.492 as of today. Uh, so kind of interesting, but it's the highest it's been since 2007. And I think that's what's really throwing everyone is, you know, these millennials, they weren't really old enough or willing normally, normally, not all of y'all. Some of y'all went like, you know, buck wild and went and bought a house at 18, but that's rare. Um, but for the grand majority of millennials, they've never seen or paid attention to the interest rates prior to 2007. And that's the last time it was this high. So for them, they're so completely used to a 2%, 3% interest rate that this is like, ah! you know, for those of us that have been in the world a little bit longer, uh, we're like, well, this, you know, this isn't great, but you know, we've been down this road before. So it's that every time I look at this, at the, the rates and, and how it's changing and stuff. And then I talk to, um, a millennial or younger even because even uh, Gen Z now is actually entering the marketplace and you know talking to them they're just like it's the end of the world as we know it and I'm just like no you need to go back and look at like 1970s 1980s that was insane so it's just kind of interesting how the generations have like you know I mean it, it's just crazy it's absolutely crazy so I, I went down this whole rabbit hole <laughs> with my sales team today. And then I was just like, okay, I think I got, I lost you at the seven living generations. <laughs> it was just 
So I'm not gonna do that to you. It was fascinating to me, but I think I may be one of the only ones on the planet. I don't know, maybe. I, tell me if I'm wrong. If you ever wanna know all of that, I will do a, a video on that. <laughs> but it was just, to me, it was really fascinating. So, all right. So what we're actually gonna talk about today uh, is actually how to invest in real estate. And you're like, you just said that these crazy interest rates and now you're saying to invest in real estate? Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Because when you're doing an investment property, it's completely different than when you're doing a residential property. Um, your home. When you're doing your home property versus uh, a residential um uh, investment property, the, the rules are completely different for you. Um, even when the mortgage rates were at three, four or five percent, when you're an investor, you're looking at maybe seven or nine percent sometimes. It just depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it and how it's correlating with your finances and stuff. Um, but yeah, they actually, investors, they actually are used to dealing with a higher interest rate. But all of that is temporary, really, uh, because they're using other people's money to make money. Okay, I'm sure you've heard all about this. I'm sure you've heard of the Burr method um, and all of that, but I'm gonna break it down for you just a little bit. And I'm sure I'm gonna have every single person on the planet uh, in my notes, or in my comments going, okay, well, what about this and what about that? And, okay, we can get really into this, okay? Um, really into this. There are many different methods. Um, what I always kind of figure is investors are gamblers. I mean, in a completely legal way, they are gamble gamblers. Um, I should say we because you know, I'm also investing in real estate. Um, but it's, it's the risk factor. It's everybody has their own method. And the closest thing that I've seen to that are gamblers. But a gambler is playing against the house. You're not. Okay. So, I mean, you are kind of going against the mortgage rates and the market and all of that, uh, the real estate market. But at the same time, if you hold it long enough, it's going to come back around. Um, one of the main things that I can tell you is when a market drops, that's, that is when millionaires are made. Not in the high market, but in the low market, in the down market. That is when millionaires are created. So over the last couple of years with real estate going up and up and up, um, you know, some of my agents have come to me and were like, okay, I really want to get into real estate and I want to invest and I want to do this and I want to do that. Um, is it the time to do so? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, uh, you are going to bank your money because you're making money on this high market. And I want you to take all of that cash. If this is your first one, take all that cash and get up a really good, um, nest egg. And then if, and when the market drops or becomes more of a normal market, like it is right now, that's when you can take that cash and go ahead and invest. You'll probably get some really good deals. You'll probably get some really good deals on, um, on, on from developers, even from, uh, you know, if you're going to build the house, then from construction companies and stuff like that. Um, more so than if you had done it, you know, like six months ago or a year ago. Um, so it just wasn't quite the time with that, you know, high market. It was, you know, a lot of investors were like, I have this money. I want to invest. There's nothing out there it, that works with my method. And it's like, no, um, no. Even investors that came in full cash, they were like, I'm going to be paying top of the market because they were competing against a lot of, um, uh, of people that were selling their home and buying over here and they were selling and they were taking the cash. And so, so they weren't, you know, cash wasn't a really big incentive. It was really, you know, um, it was a little crazy actually. So, you know, investors really, you know, weren't able to invest in real estate. So they've just kind of been sitting on the sidelines for a, a little while now, a couple of years now, and just kind of waiting for the market to shift. And that's slowly starting to happen. So we're starting to see those deals trickle back in 
Um, but there's right now there's so many investors that are waiting for those deals that they're getting snapped up like crazy. Um, and they're still not as good as they, they could be. So uh, they'll probably just keep looking. It's like sharks just swimming around, circling, looking for those deals. That's what they do. Patience is key. One of the main questions, the first questions that I ask an investor when they first come to me and say, I want to invest in real estate. I want to invest in residential real estate. I want to invest in Ocala and I want to do it through you. My first question is wonderful. What's your timeline? What's your exit strategy? I want to know if they're playing for a couple of years, five years, 10 years until their kids graduate from college because there's different strategies and different things I would recommend depending on when they need to get that cash back out. Uh, so it's just a little different. Um, as you go through the different methods, I would highly recommend, highly recommend that you talk to a real estate investment consultant. Not all real estate agents understand investment real estate. When I first worked at a real estate company, um, I worked in property management. <laughs> it was the time of great sorrow back in 2008, 2007. Um, so yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of work to be done in real estate. So I did what I could, but it was fantastic because I learned property management. Um, learning property management at that time, I also understood what investors were looking for what renters, tenants, what they were looking for, why a house would um, be a great rental investment and why a house maybe wouldn't. Uh, so I was able to help those investors. Now, that particular company um, had a policy that property managers could not assist uh, in sales transactions. They could not do sales uh, because it was very difficult to train up a property manager and get them to where they needed to go. So they preferred that we stay out of sales because they didn't want us, you know, going to the dark side or whatever. <laughs> so they didn't want to lose us. It was, um, it, you know, training a salesperson is difficult, but it's not like training a property manager where you have to learn all of the laws, the forms, the leases, the, uh, you know, how to uh, have a tenant go through the application process. It is extremely complicated. Uh, so yeah, I, I learned all of that. And I learned how to work with investors, uh, but I eventually had to leave that company because I wanted to continue working with investors. I really think thought that I had something of value to offer them. So I went and, you know, went on to another, another company that allowed me to do both. And it was fantastic. I loved it. Uh, especially 1031 exchanges. I will do a whole other video just on 1031 exchanges. It is the best thing ever whether it's in stocks and bonds or whether it's in residential real estate or commercial real estate or whatever you want to do, it is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Utilize it, definitely. But we will get into that, all the pros, cons, and um, speed bumps, <laughs> the hiccups that could, could come up. We'll get into that on a different video. For this one, I just want to talk about one of the methods, probably one of the most common methods that people use when they are getting into real estate investing. This is called the Burr method. It's B-R-R-R-R. -R -R -R. It's four R's. Four. Okay. So this is a strategy where investors buy and rehab a distressed property. They rent it out. They do um, a cash out refinance. And then with that cash, they don't stick it in their pocket. They utilize that to wash, rinse, repeat. They just keep doing it over and over again. <sighs> How much money you need to get this process started depends on, again, how much time for the entire thing you have, when you need to exit out of it. Like if you're doing this for uh, for college funds or something for your, instead of, you know, putting money into, uh, you know, into a college fund, you decide to go ahead and invest your, your money into real estate and utilize that money for your college fund for your kids. You're going to use that money for their college. Um, it's a huge difference if your child is like 11, 12, maybe looking at high school not too far away, 
versus if they're two, okay? Completely different thing. Uh, you're going to, at two, <laughs> where you have lots of time, you can start small. You can afford to start very small. Uh, you can buy a house, you know, that is tens of thousands of dollars instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and you can be a little riskier because if you lose all of it, you're not really in it that far anyway. So you can kind of, you know, start at that point. Um, each time that you wash, rinse, repeat, you're going to move up in houses, in house or houses. So maybe you start with a condo, very simple condo. It's not going to bring you a whole lot of money coming in because there's a condo association and this, that, and the other, but it will bring in some money. Uh, maybe you, you get a mobile home or maybe you get um, a small cottage or something, something small just to start. Maybe you even get a duplex on an FHA, live on one side, rent out the other. Now, is that something that I would want to do? No, no, um, because then you are <laughs> available 24 seven to your tenant. Um, if you don't like your tenant, it's, you're still available to them 24 <clears> seven. <throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. <coughs> Excuse me. So it may not be something that I would recommend, but it is something, you know, for a short period of time until you go through the process of wash, rinse, repeat, uh, that you may be able to put up with. You might be like, okay, let's do this. Um, and then just, you know, keep moving up. Okay. Keep moving up. That's the main point. So what do you do? You first buy, you make the most money in your buy, in your purchase. Okay. It's not when you go to sell, it's when you buy, because if you save the most money then and no, negotiate really good terms, that's going to influence everything else past that. So you buy, you find a great deal on a rental property. This is not a property that you are moving into necessarily, most likely not. This is a rental property. So we're not looking for the Taj Mahal. I have had some newer investors come in and they're like, oh, I want all white kitchen and I want this and I want uh, that. You're not living there. <laughs> You're not living there. What does the market want? What do the residents want in that area? If they just want something that is open floor plan and functional and lower rent, then why are you putting stainless steel appliances into this? Look at the market uh, of what you have right there and then go from there. All right. So you're going to get a great deal on a rental property. You're going to buy that. You're going to go ahead and rehab that. Fix up the property. Don't go overboard. Don't make it the nicest house on the street. It doesn't need to be the nicest house on the street. Um, you need it to be updated. Um, you know, if it's like you walk in and it's shag carpeting, it's like, hello, 1970, and you can hear the disco music. Okay. That might be a problem. Okay. That might be a problem. Um, I would highly recommend hard floors as opposed to carpeting. I absolutely hate having carpeting in rentals completely. And then a few times I've had tenants go, but I really like carpeting. Great. Get an area rug and take it with you when you go along with whatever you've got living in it. I'm good. <laughs> no. Uh, I just don't like, I don't like carpeting, especially in Florida where we're already dealing with all sorts of moisture issues and we're dealing with sand and we're dealing with, you know, everybody goes barefoot and it just, no, just no. So I normally recommend if you can, especially again, we're talking in Florida here. Um, if you can go ahead and just do tile throughout. Now, again, it's if you can, because if you're going with a a mobile home or manufactured home, I would not recommend tile. So again, it's really depends on what it is, where it is and what you're going to do with it. Um, but talk to a real estate agent that has experience and hopefully has their own investment properties and see what they've done and what they've learned over the years, because then you can learn from all of their past mistakes or mistakes they've seen other people make and you don't have to make them. It's invaluable, invaluable. All right, so you're going to buy it, you're going to rehab it, and then you're going to rent it out. You're going to find tenants, you're going to rent the property, hopefully at the market rate. You're going to then refinance. So you're going to get a loan that covers the purchase price plus the repairs. What are you going to do with that money? Again, we are not putting it in our pocket. 
we're gonna go ahead and repeat. So you're gonna use that money as a down payment to buy another property and you're gonna do it all over again. Okay, so that's the Burr method. You're just gonna keep going. This is not a money-making thing for you at this point. This is an investment um, procedure that basic or method that over time could make you a millionaire, but it's not going to, if you're going to constantly be taking the money from the rent and putting it in your pocket, it's probably not a good idea for you. Okay. Um, you probably want to just keep utilizing that money for the portfolio. Now, normally, and things change all the time in the mortgage world, but normally you have to have an investment property for two years before you can consider that income, like on an LLC or something like that. That is not necessarily accurate anymore. They have shifted that a little bit. So, um, and there are other methods and instead of like a conventional loan or something like that, you could actually do um, maybe a hard money lender or something. There are other ways to do that without going through that two year rule. But I, I'm gonna talk about, you know, on average, that's, you know, that's what you're gonna find out there. So there's other things that you can do though. All right. So how does it work? So the process begins with buying that property at the lowest listed price or off market price that you can find. Um, you want to find something that has good bones. You don't want to have to do a whole total overhaul. If you got to call a GC in, a general contractor in, um, I would strongly suggest you know what you're doing first to have done a few, get a, get a few under your belt before you tackle something like that. Anything with like foundation issues or anything, yeah. <laughs> Not on your first one, okay? <laughs> Just uh, wouldn't recommend it, okay? Um, you need something where it's structurally sound and maybe just has some character that needs to be removed. <laughs> so, you know, give it a facelift, make it pretty, but not necessarily, you know, new roof, new new foundation, uh, you know, there's cracks where you could like stick your hand through the walls. Yeah, nothing like that. That's That's not what you're doing here. Um, so you want to make sure that you know what you're doing. I know one of the things that I've seen investors uh, make a mistake on is they do the work themselves. Why is that a mistake? Some of the work, absolutely do it yourself. However, keep in mind that time is money. Time equals money. That's basically what you're renting is the house, but it's at time. So for every, figure out what you're going to rent the house for, divide that by 30 and that's your daily amount that you're spending. And if you have a full-time job already, plus you've got a family and stuff like that, you're not gonna have a lot of time to put into this. It is often better to go ahead and pay Joe Schmo over here to go over and do the work you can do. It. Yeah, absolutely, you can do it, but if it's gonna take you two weeks and it's only gonna take him two days, why are we even discussing it? Pay him to go do it and get it done. Because again, the longer this takes, the more money you have out of pocket for the mortgage and the less money you have coming in from a tenant. All right, so once you've got those necessary updates, you've got a nice looking property, something somebody would actually want to live in. <laughs> um, now you're gonna go ahead and find a tenant. Um, often you can go ahead and have a property management company do a one-time leasing. What that means is if you wanna manage it yourself, but you want them to find the tenant, you can go ahead and do that. It's not what I would recommend necessarily, but it is something that a lot of companies offer uh, and something that you may be interested in doing. So just make sure that they're not gonna put just anybody in there because they don't have the headache of managing it. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Once uh, you've got a good tenant in place, you're going to basically increase the home's value. Uh, this is basically, what you need to do in order to get the refinancing done. So you've got the tenant in place, it makes it an investment property. You've got, you know, the, the character being not character flaws, but good character in the house. It's like, oh, that's, yeah, mm -mm, yeah. So any interesting smells have been taken care of, you know, all that stuff. Um, that's when you're gonna go ahead and refinance. You're gonna have an appraisal, you're gonna have all of that. And that's where you go from there. Um, you, when you refinance the property with either a bank or credit union, uh, you're then going to take the money from the initial lender, probably a hard money lender, 
maybe it was your own bank account, whatever. And you're gonna pay that back and then you're gonna take what you earn and then you're going to use that for your next one. So within two houses, basically, you're no longer out of pocket. You're actually then earning. So it just keeps going. Um, now keep in mind that the bank will only give you a percentage of the property's appraised value when you go to refinance. They're not gonna be like, oh, this house is worth 100,000. So we're gonna give you 100,000 and that's not how it works. Um, they will probably do it for about 80% of the value. So it'd be 80,000 in that particular scenario. That leaves you with enough money to pay off the short-term lender or the hard money lender or whatever you wanna call them, Uncle Bob, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then you're going to um, also use that to absorb the leftover. All right, I'm trying to read my notes at the same time, it's going really well. <laughs> it's like everything I know about investments in this particular method in under 30 minutes. We're doing well. <laughs> Y'all, seriously, if you have questions on this or if you're trying to do it, please just call me. Call me or email me. Uh, that is so much better because then it can be set to your specific needs. I have agents that specifically do investment real estate and that's pretty much all they do. And they have their own investments and they work with property management and it's just like this whole thing. Um, There's some real, real estate agents that I have that don't do investment real estate and I wouldn't necessarily recommend them for somebody that's going into that avenue. So just be aware of that. It's not all real estate agents are the same. It's not like we all get the same information, education, and experience. It doesn't happen. Okay, so it's basically, again, a method for investing. This method, along with a lot of other real estate methods um, for investment is investing, okay? This is not, okay, I'm gonna put this much in and then I'm gonna make all this money coming out with rent, no. For the most part, you're going to continue investing. This is just a side thing that will eventually, eventually make money. It's not like when you do your 401k, you're like, I'm gonna put this money in there and then in two years, I'm gonna be a millionaire. It doesn't work that way, okay? <laughs> We're creating our own compound interest, but at the same time, the same time, time is a factor for this. Also, risk is a factor for crying out loud when you're going to do something like this, any kind of investing, I don't even care what kind of investing it is. Please factor in risk. Okay, so many people are like, oh, I'm just gonna do this, this, and this. And I'm like, that sounds really risky. Oh, well, you know, but the money is there. And I'm like, mm, you didn't factor in risk. You didn't protect yourself. You didn't insure. Oh, but that's more money. Sometimes it's worth it. <laughs> Sometimes it's worth it. Uh, so you want to, you want to protect yourself. You want to protect your family. You don't want to be doing all of this for nothing. Okay. Uh, so definitely factor in risk for anything that you're doing. If the market dropped out from underneath you, do you have a contingency plan? Do you have an exit strategy for when you decide that it's time to go ahead and pull out of this, this thing <laughs> that you have created, this empire that you've created? What's your exit strategy? What's your timeline? Do you have a contingency plan? These are the things that you need to consider when you're getting into any kind of investing, okay? Now, there is something called the 1% rule. Uh, it's a 1% rule that they use in this method and other methods. As I said, every investor has their own method. They're all gamblers, I promise. <laughs> uh, but the 1% rule is, it's just an easy way to calculate how much rent you should charge and how much, um, basically how much you'd be willing to pay for the house, depending on how much rent you have coming out along with any expenses. Like if you have, you know, your taxes, your insurance, your property manager, your maintenance that you need to do, anything like that. You factor all of that in, you get a nice little report from um, any, any investment real estate agent will be able to send you a report on a house that should factor all of that in. Double check the numbers. Just because they type stuff in doesn't mean it's accurate. Uh, <laughs> but double check those numbers according to what you see as well. Um, and then just kind of go from there. I, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you do in fact invest in real estate. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic thing um, to invest in, obviously. I obviously believe in real estate, um, but you also need to consider it an investment. Um, there's risk involved. 
there are methods that you can use. There is nothing more valuable than good advice. Because again, learning from other people's mistakes is the best thing you can do because then you don't have to make those mistakes. I truly believe in learning from somebody else's mistakes. I love seeing somebody else do something really, really awful and then I'm like, oh, oh see, I saw how they slid down that. I'm not doing that. So that invaluable, okay? It's like you made the mistake without the pain. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. All right, well, I about 30 minutes or less. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and hit the stats for this week from Marion County. We have, this is everything up on MLS for Marion County within the last seven days. We had 237 active listings. We had 19 price increases, 333 price decreases. Hmm, wonder what the market's doing. Back on the market, we had 49. Uh, sold, we had 209. Pending, 224. Canceled, 37. We had five expired, which isn't very much, but we'll probably see more later in the week. Temporarily off the market, 23. We had six withdrawn. Wow, what an interesting week. Those numbers are very different from the week before and the week before that. That is interesting stuff right there. Uh, but again, 209 sold, 224 pending. That means that houses are still being sold. Uh, but, you know, obviously 333 price decreases. That obviously means they're being sold for less. What is the current average home price in Marion County? Well, I could not pull up the numbers for October yet, but I probably will be able to uh, later in the week. I'll have that information for you next week. Uh, but as far as right now, it's 265000 That is the average home sold price that we have for Marion County right now, 265000 So it has come down, not as drastically as everybody was predicting, including myself, but it has actually come down. We were topping out a little over 300000 at the beginning of the year. So we've come down. However, if you look at last year's numbers and even this year's numbers going up to now, um, it's not at its lowest point, not even close. All right, so again, that national average rate, uh, the average interest rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage with 20% down, conventional, this is gonna be at 7.492%. That's the average, you can get lower, you can get better, you could get higher, uh, but it is the highest since 2007. Uh, the average interest rate over the last 50 years, so 1972 to 2022, is 7.77%. So we are still below average, but only barely, okay? We're only just, just sliding under there. All right, so let's go what is going on this weekend. Oh, we have chili cook-off. Yes, I love the chili cook-off every year. I love it. We participate every year. I have yet to get a trophy, but that's okay. I don't hold a grudge much. Um, and we are doing a whole new theme this, this year. So um, <laughs> you may see me in coconuts. Anyway, I'm not gonna go into it too much because it's not until Saturday, but. Uh, it is from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Southeastern Livestock Pavilion. You just come out there and come hungry because there's a lot of chili, okay? And at least a few people burn theirs. We never burn ours, but at least a few people, they get like a really deep, deep pan and they use like a boat or a stir it. That's the easiest way to burn your chili. Um, so <laughs> it's like crazy. We use really, really shallow pans. So, and it's, we slowly, slowly heat it up. Um, so yeah, we, we don't do that, but, but there will be at least a few that burn theirs. I mean, there's like a, over a hundred different kinds of chili you're going to get. It's, it's crazy. It's absolute mayhem. Every booth is themed a different thing. Um, both fire departments are there. There's the Marion County Fire Department and they are in direct competition with the Ocala Fire Department. And it's just hilarious, the antics they get into. Um, absolute fun, absolute mayhem. There's live music. There's a bunch of stuff for kids. Uh, we're going to be doing games and stuff for kids as well, as well as a huge giveaway if you can name the price of the house. Okay, so we're going to have a house 
sitting there and you're going to name what you think is the going rate, the price for that particular house. Should be cool. All right. Uh, so that is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. this Saturday. We have the Soggy Doggy Swim. I really wanted to go to that. I don't even have a doggy anymore, but um, I really wanted to see all the other dogs just go absolutely nuts in the pool. That is at Jervy Gant. It starts at 10 a.m. It kind of goes throughout the day. Um, it's $10 per dog. And it's basically the end of the year or so. Um, they're, the pool is closing for humans. So the dog get to go and swim before they clean the whole thing up. So I, it's just, I think it's really nifty. I hope that whoever goes get lots of pictures because I think it's going to be great. Over at Brown's Farm, they have Junk in the Trunk and they also have the Fall Extravaganza. So it's basically the place to be. Uh, the Ocala Food and Wine Festival is going on over at the World Equestrian Center. So oh, I wanted to go to that too. There's just so much. There's so much. It's hard to decide what stuff to go to because it's all so great. But the chili cook-off is best because I'm going to be there because it's going to be awesome. I love it. Uh, we also have the Macintosh 1890s Festival, which sounded like a lot of fun. And we also have the first, the free first Saturday over at the Appleton Museum. And of course, we have the downtown market. There is so much going on. You can do a few different activities. Maybe do the downtown market do the chili cook-off, then head over to the free for a Saturday. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a way to do all of it. Brown's Farm is actually open the next day. Not the check in the trunk. That's only on Saturday, but that is earlier in the morning. So maybe Brown's first, then the Ocala Market, then the chili cook-off, then the apple chip. I don't know. I don't know. There's, this is just so much. It's just so much. All right, so next week, uh, we are going to be back with more information, including how to interview a property manager. So hopefully you'll stick around for that. Um, and again, thank you so much for those 3,000 subscribers. I am truly honored. I really appreciate all of the love and support you guys have given us over the last few years. Um, and we'll just continue doing what we do. So thanks again, you guys. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, put them in the comments below or go ahead and send us an email at ger.expectmore at gmail.com. Thanks for watching. Bye.